Our speaker tonight is author Miles Harvey, and we are thrilled to have him here. Um, he is the author of national and international bestseller, The Island of Lost Maps. He is also the recipient of the Knight Wallace Journalism Fellowship at the University of Michigan. Um, currently, he is a teacher. He teaches creative writing at DePaul University in Chicago. Um, and he is also the founding editor of Big Shoulders Books and the director of the DePaul Publishing Institute. His latest book, The King of Confidence, um, is set in our area here um, in Northern Michigan on Beaver Island with um, an extremely interesting and charismatic uh, con man that I'm excited to hear more about. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and let Miles uh, share his screen and introduce himself and we will get underway. Great. Well, um, thanks so much. Well, I'd like to just start uh, by thanking Beth uh, Wemguas and uh, the Harbor Springs Area Historical Society. It's such an honor to be with you and I I'm so glad and excited to be among people who um, uh, have a lot of interest and stake in the story I'm about to tell and I'm anxious to converse with you about it. So um, without further ado, I'll share the screen. So this, um, let me make sure. Um, okay, so I, I have a feeling a lot of people in the audience have, have seen this guy's image somewhere. Um, James Jesse Strang, uh, he's sort of legendary uh, in the Midwest in general, but in your area especially. Um, and, you know, I, I write in the book that I think he sort of has this, um, to a lot of people, he's sort of like Johnny Appleseed or Paul Bunyan. He's this guy you've heard a lot about and heard stories. Uh, whenever I do one of these, I, I get some questions about, did you ever hear about the time my great uncle said, you know, that, uh, but, but the thing about Strang for me is that he's interesting as a legend, but even more interesting as a human being. Um, and so uh, this book was just an absolute joy for me to write. And I wanted to just um, uh, talk about this guy uh, for a minute. I thought I'd start, I'm gonna do two incredibly short readings from the book. I thought I would just start by really trying to, you know, as many of you know, Strang took hundreds of people to Beaver Island in the 1850s um, and convinced them the second coming of Christ was happening imminently, possibly on Beaver Island. Um, and when we look at his picture, I don't think we say, oh my God, I can see why that guy would uh, bring a ton of people to Beaver Island and would have such fanatical followers. Um, but uh, he did nonetheless. And I, I wanna talk about, um, what his allure was. So I thought I'd just read a very short section from the book, a couple of paragraphs. So, although James Jesse Strang was physically unimposing, a few inches over five feet and bald with an oddly bulging forehead, he did possess one distinguishing feature, his dark brown eyes, which one acquaintance described as rather small, but very bright and piercing, giving an extremely animated expression to his whole countenance. Another claimed that those eyes seemed as though they could bore right through a person. But more than any tangible attribute, Strang possessed an invisible, ineffable quality called confidence. And in those days before electri electrical power, confidence was what, what made antebellum America hum. Confidence was black magic, good fortune, and hard cash combined. Confidence could turn worthless paper into glittering gold, cow towns into cities, empty lots into bustling businesses, losers into winners, paupers into millionaires. Confidence was a charm deployed by bankers and merchants, philosophers and politicians, clergymen and card sharps alike. Confidence was the soul of trade in the words of one leading financial publication. Without it, added the novelist Herman Melville, commerce between man and man as between country and country would, like a watch, run down and stop. In an age before the federal government began printing paper money, an age when people had to trust in privately issued banknotes, which were essentially glorified IOUs, confidence was the de facto national currency. And so what James Jesse Strang 
had going for him is that he inspired confidence and he was able to gain people's confidence. Well, well how did he do that? So I thought we'd start with his, his childhood. He grew up in what was called the burned over district. This was an area in Western New York um, that was radically changed by the uh, Erie Canal, which brought not only people into Western New York, but new ideas, some of them amazing. It was the hub of the proto-feminist movement, the women's movement. It was a big hub of abolitionism, but it was also just this incredibly charged religious atmosphere. Traditional meetings, uh, tr traditional religions, um, Protestantism, with the, the, these camp meetings like this were pictured here were common, but there were also all sorts of uh, spin-off religions and a brand new religions. Mormonism famously started in this part of the world, um, but also just new ideas like spiritualism, you know, table knocking started all in this one place. So it was this crazy idea or crazy area where all sorts of ideas and all sorts of passions were flying around. And they called it the burned over district because so many religious fires had burned through. Strang grew up as a farm boy um, in a, a, a very a traditional Baptist home. His parents were very religious. And one of the cool things for me about Strang uh, as a researcher was that we had his journals from the time he was uh, in his late teens to his early 20s. And he sort of kept an official version and a version in code. He was a very, he loved coded things. He loved hiding things away from other people. And in this code, which he developed himself, he, he confessed two things. One, he said, I'm a total atheist. I don't believe in any of this stuff that my family believes in. And two, he said, but you know, when I talk about religion, people really, really listen to me and I'm really good at it. And so from the start with Strang, we have this mix of idealism and opportunism and both in one human being. And it's one of the things that made it so interesting. Well, in the burned over district, he did many jobs. He was uh, a lawyer um, and he sort of failed at that um, partly because his clients got tired of him ripping them off. Um, he was a postmaster, which at the time was a, a really important patronage job, but he was a Democrat. And when the Democrats um, lost the White House, he was fired from that. And he started a newspaper and he failed at that. But he was, these failures sort of led to a metamorphosis, a new strang. Um, he had to leave uh, Western New York. Uh, he had to fly by night because the story goes that he sold some land in Ohio to uh, someone in Western New York. Uh, they went to Ohio to claim their land and found that there was no land. And so according to press reports at the time, Strang faked his own death and left town overnight. He later denied this, um, but uh, his actions would indicate that that was probably a good bet that he, he was involved in some sort of scam. He wound up in the place where you'll see that green star in Burlington, Wisconsin. This was just at the start of the Wisconsin territory. Um, and Strang uh, wound up with some other expats from Western New York who happened to be Mormons. Uh, one of his best friends was a Mormon. Um, and he picked up his law career again, um, practicing law in Wisconsin and Illinois. Um, and in uh, 1843, he went to this town, uh, which is Nauvoo, Illinois, on uh, the Mississippi River. Uh, Nauvoo, as you can tell from this picture, was quite a town. It was arguably uh, as big or bigger than Chicago. It was the hub of the Mormon church. It was an international city. Um, the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints had done an amazing job of recruiting people from um, all over the world, especially England. So there were a lot of um, people born in England in Nauvoo. And Nauvoo was kind of a, a, a separate uh, city-state of sorts. Um, and so Strang visited this city and something happened to him there and he converted to Mormonism, which was then a brand new religion. He met Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, and he converted. And one of the important questions about Strang, and I'll, I'll give you a spoiler alert, I don't have an answer, is whether he was serious about Mormonism, whether this atheist had 
suddenly found a faith that he really believed in, or whether he saw it as a, a, an opportunity um, to make some money. Um, so in any case, in um, June of 1844, near Nauvoo, the founder and prophet of Mormonism, Joseph Smith, was uh, killed by uh, uh, an anti-Mormon mob. Um, and shortly thereafter, there was a crisis in the church because Smith hadn't named a successor. Um, and shortly thereafter, um, a, a guy from Wisconsin named James Jesse Strang showed up with this letter. The letter still survives. It's at Yale, Yale University in the Beinecke Library with a lot of Strang stuff. It's very exciting to, to see this stuff. And what this letter essentially does, it's, it's a letter supposedly from Smith to Strang saying basically, hey, I hand the church over to you. Now, this would be like, uh, I live in Chicago. It would be like um, uh, Mayor Lori Lightfoot, the mayor of Chicago, suddenly saying, okay, uh, I'm stepping down and Miles Harvey is in charge of Chicago. Um, it makes no sense. Strang had just joined the church. He was not powerful within the church. And um, modern experts think, and I think they're right, that this is a forgery, but it's a very good forgery. Strang was a good writer and he also understood the postal system. And it, that really gave him an advantage. Anyway, Strang walked like 200 miles to some Mormon gatherings and started showing this letter around saying, I'm in charge here. I, th this church is mine. And they sort of laughed him out of there. They said, who's this guy? We don't even know you. Uh, that's a forgery. But Strang didn't stop trying. He, he, he was back in this little town in Wisconsin. He started drawing some followers. Um, and in 1845, his followers dug out of the ground these brass plates. And these aren't the brass plates, but this is like a uh, transcription. This is exactly what the brass plates supposedly looked like. Now, um, I'm hoping someone um, can read that for us. Um, uh, it's actually a trick question. No one can read that. Uh, the script was, um, uh, no one in the world could read it, except luckily one person could read it. Uh, he took it back and translated it. Um, through his uh, mystical superpowers. And that person was James Jesse Strang. And what these plates essentially said, they were from uh, a heretofore unheard of person named Raja Manchu, who had supposedly lived in Wisconsin <laughs> centuries earlier and died. But these plates basically said, James Jesse Strang is the great prophet and he should be in charge of the church. Um, uh, so we laugh at that. He started getting a lot of followers, hundreds and hundreds of followers from all over the country and in, indeed all over the world. Um, and, uh, you know, it's easy to laugh at that and say, like, why would anyone believe him? Digging these brass plates with one of his associates later said was uh, an old kettle that they pounded out and, and etched in some lettering into. Um, but I, I think to understand why Strang um, gain so many followers. We need to think about the times. And I, I just wanna, these people aren't normally showed to get, shown together, um, but they're the two of the most, you know, amazing human beings to come out of Strang's time. Um, the person with the beard is Karl Marx, the founder of communism. Uh, the person without the beard is T.T. Barnum, the great showman. We think of Barnum as a circus master, but he was in fact a professional fraudster. Um, he had a museum in New York. We'll talk about that in a second. But I bring Marx up because um, he's a total contempor uh, contemporary of Strang. The Communist Manifesto was written in 1848. And no matter what you think about that book, it's a really interesting little pamphlet book. Um, it's fascinating in its diagnosis of the time. This was a time of incredible change all over the world, but especially in the, well, not especially in the United States, in the United States. It's a time when you have the photograph has just come in, which changes our fundamental notions of space and time. You can, for the first time, stop time. You can preserve people. Uh, one of the things done with the early photograph is it was, it was constantly taken of dead people because people wanted to remember their, their ancestors. Um, the telegraph comes in and all of a sudden, um, you could be in Harbor Springs and I could be in Springfield, Illinois, where I am today at a hotel, and we could be talking simultaneously. And this fundamentally changed the way people live. 
it, it was also um, the, the railroads changed everything. It's also the lead up to the Civil War. So you have this increasingly divided country, this increasingly um, uh, unstable country. And, and this is a time when uh, truth becomes porous. It becomes something contested. People don't accept other people's truths. One of the things about Marx that was so interesting is his analysis of this. He said in the Communist Manifesto, all that is solid melts into air. And I think that's just a pe the feeling a lot of people had. And it's a feeling this guy P.T. Barnum would take advantage of. For instance, this is one of Barnum's famous exhibits at his American Museum in New York, which was kind of like one of the biggest tourist attractions in the United States at that time. And this is a mermaid, said Barnum. Um, and people would come by the thousands to the American Museum in New York to see Barnum's mermaid and his other exhibits. And some people would say, hey, uh, that's a mermaid. And other people would say, that's not a mermaid. That's a monkey stitched to a fish. And the thing about Barnum in this world where the truth isn't quite clear is Barnum would say, hey, it could be. Why don't you, you don't think it's a mermaid? Why don't you bring your grandmother in? And why don't you bring all your cousins in and they can pay the entry fee? And then we'll argue about it again. So that it was this time where nothing seemed uh, quite real. And it was this time when we get the word confidence artist and confidence man. We know exactly when that word comes from. It's uh, 1849 and a newspaper in New York. And it spreads like wildfire throughout the United States. It's really interesting to watch how fast this phrase spreads. Within a couple of months, there was a play on Broadway called The Confidence Man. Um, it's just that there were so many of these people in this world of unclear truth um, running around. Um, and I thought I might read, oh, here's, here's a, it was a time also of a, apocalypse, right? So in 1848, many people thought the world was coming to an end. And as the world was coming to an end, there were all these sightings of sea serpents all over the world. And um, Strang uh, <laughs> chimed in. He said that there was sea serpents, uh, sea serpents spotted off Beaver Island. Um, it, again, it seems um, almost bizarre to us, but uh, I think there were reasons for it. Um, Charles Dickens, um, who, the American no or the British novelist, came to the United States in, in, in the 1840s, and he was fascinated by what he saw as our attraction to a certain kind of um, con men, although that word didn't exist. Um, but Dickens was really interested in uh, um, Americans' use of the term smart man, smart man. So Dickens goes to Cairo, Illinois, down at the southern tip of my home state in Illinois, where there's been this land scam. This guy has sold a bunch of swamp land to English people, um, claiming that they're moving to uh, paradise. And they get there, and it's this terrible land. And um, uh, Dickens uh, visited Cairo, and he was really interested um, in talking to local people there about this con artist. He, so here's, here's how he described it. The following dialogue I have held a hundred times. Is it not very, a very disgraceful circumstances, circumstance that such a man as so-and-so should be acquiring a large property by the most infamous and odious means, and notwithstanding all the crimes of which he has been guilty, should be tolerated and abetted by your citizens. He is a public nuisance, is he not? To which Dickens was told, yes, sir, a convicted liar. Yes, sir, he has been kicked and cuffed and caned. Oh, yes, sir, and he is utterly dishonorable debased and profligate. Yes, sir. In the name of wonder then, what is his merit? Well, sir, he is a smart man. And so I think uh, it may be an American thing still, but it definitely was a, an American thing then, at least in Dickens' mind, that we were drawn to these sort of con artists and that we as Americans somehow loved sort of being lied to in our face. And we just said, well, He's very smart. He's very good at ripping people off. Well, Strang surrounded himself with some of the most notorious 
and colorful con artists of the 19th century. Um, this is a guy by the name of uh, John C. Bennett. Um, he was um, Strang's right-hand man, and he is the person who came up, it appears, with the scheme to move Strang's utopian colony of Mormons from this little town in Wisconsin to Beaver Island. Um, uh, Bennett never had a medical degree, but he was a famous quack doctor. Interestingly with him, he was, um, he was a big advocate of the tomato, the health effects of the tomato. And it turned out he was right about that one. The tomato was not a popular food, but he helped make it one. Um, but he, uh, when he was in Nauvoo, he had been in the Mormon colony in Nauvoo. Um, the Illinois governor at the time called him the greatest scamp in the Western country. And he was, uh, as I said, he was a quack doctor. He ran a diploma mill before he got to Nauvoo. In other words, um, if you wanted a, a law degree or a medical degree, all you had to do is write him and send a check and he would send you a, a degree. And in Nauvoo, he became one of the, the, the leaders of, of the Mormon church. He, 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 Joseph Smith's close associate, he led, even though he had no military training, he led this huge uh, military, paramilitary force in Nauvoo and um, became the mayor of Nauvoo. And he's often credited with being the um, author of the spiritual wife doctrine. In other words, um, introducing notions about polygamy secretly to the Mormon community, um, which um, was a, a closely kept secret for a long time within the hierarchy of the Mormon church. Um, the trouble with Bennett and the reason he got uh, kicked out of the church is he, did, he didn't do a good job of keeping it a secret. He basically, um, uh, was sort of a, a serial offender and um, um, got in a lot of trouble and was eventually kicked out of Novo and he wound up with Strang. Here's another guy who wound up with Strang. This is a guy, um, one of my favorite is a guy named George Adams. And this guy was a famous, uh, uh, even apart from Strang, uh, Shakespearean actor slash Mormon preacher. He would go to um, uh, uh, a theater one day and do his um, rendition of Richard III. And the next day he would preach on behalf of the Mormon church. He too was in Nauvoo. He was incredibly effective at bringing people into the church. Um, he went to England and brought hundreds and hundreds of people into the Mormon church to, to go blind to Nauvoo without any uh, information really other than his word that uh, this was paradise on earth. And um, uh, he was described by the New York Times as a deceiver of the first class. Um, he was described by the same New York Times story as as poor an actor as ever spoke. Uh, he was a notorious drunk, but he was also a legendary uh, 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 opponent of alcohol who would go around uh, <laughs> preaching against it and then getting drunk. He, um, he it was said to have such intensely bad body odor that when another actor borrowed one of his costumes, um, he, uh, it could never be worn again. It had to be burned. Um, this picture is from, uh, I think I'm the first person to track this picture down. It's from a, a newspaper in Boston in 1847. And it is obviously making fun of him. And, and this newspaper editor who wrote about him, this hilarious guy um, who really ripped into Adams um, and made him look like a fop in this picture, you know, um, and a kind of a fraud. And, and Adams famously, and this made headline worldwide, believe it or not, tracked this editor down in the streets of Boston and horsewhipped him <laughs> and, and uh, you know, beat the man silly and then announced um, exactly where he was playing his next rendition of Richard III to the audience that had gathered around him. So um, we might know Adams today from this guy, Mark Twain. Um, Twain, um, long after uh, James Jesse Strang, the guy I wrote about, was murdered and the Beaver Island colony fell apart. Um, Adams started um, a colony uh, um, in Jaffa in the Holy Land. And um, it was, uh, as you can imagine from what I've told you about Adams, it was not only doomed to failure, but tragic failure people. A lot of people died. And, and when Mark Twain was um, on a boat and visiting the Middle East at that time. And he, um, his boat picked up some survivors of this colony and, and Twain wrote about Adams and um, was not an Adams fan, but it was clearly 
fascinated by him. And at least one scholar, and I think he makes a very good argument, has said that Adams later wound up in Huckleberry Finn as the king, <laughs> the legendary sort of con man or the, the con man who along with the Duke goes around uh, ripping people off, but also uh, performing um, uh, uh, theatrical productions. So um, uh, here's another con man uh, from Strang's um, group. This is Charles J. Douglas, who in 1849, uh, Strang began uh, introducing to everyone who would listen as his nephew and secretary. Um, for many months, Strang and this young man uh, traveled the East Coast together. They would uh, recruit converts to the faith and uh, ask for money by day. And uh, Strang was very good at getting converts to the faith. And at night, they would go back and, and, and share a hotel room together. Well, it turns out that um, Charles J. Douglas was not, in fact, Charles J. Douglas. Charles J. Douglas was not, in fact, a young man. Charles J. Douglas was Elvira Fields, who was a, a young woman who um, was Strang's first plural wife. In other words, his first polygamous wife. Um, Strang's original wife, who he'd been married to for quite a long time by then, had no idea and Strang didn't want her to know. So that's, um, that's why they traveled this way together. If you look at this picture, I mean, depending on your opinion, uh, it, it may look like a young man. Did everyone believe it? No, they did not. Uh, people, uh, a number of people said, why is Strang traveling with a woman? Oh, I think we know why Strang is traveling with a woman. But um, uh, many other people were fooled. And, I, and I, I, have, I think that has something to do with um, just um, the, the dress code at the time. It was a time when women wore really extravagant symbols of femininity, right? They wore these many petticoats. Um, and I just think that people were not not used to seeing a woman dressed in men's clothing and had a hard time um, identifying. Um, at any rate, um, right around the time that Strang was traveling with this young woman, um, he uh, established this colony on Beaver Island. Well, um, this map is completely unnecessary for this audience. But usually after I want to show where Beaver Island is, so um, uh, you know where it is. Why did Strang move to Beaver Island? Um, so uh, maybe a couple of reasons. First, in his utopian colony in southern Wisconsin, um, he'd made a lot of enemies. When he first started the colony, many people from Nauvoo came, including one of Joseph Smith's brothers and, in theory, Joseph Smith's mother, although it's not clear that she spent I can't remember if she spent any time in the colony, but she initially endorsed Strang. And some of um, Smith's real followers, like true believers, not, not con men, people of faith went to Strang, but they, they, many of them quickly grew, grew uh, tired of him and soured on him. And um, um, the problem in, in Southern Wisconsin, as I see it, is that Strang's followers could leave and his enemies could stay. Um, and so he ended up moving uh, to Beaver Island. Um, there were definitely advantages. This is at a time when we're first seeing that we didn't have the word cult then, or we didn't use it in that way. But this is a time when historians are first seeing this sort of widespread cult-like behavior. And those of you who know anything about cults know that physical isolation is one of the crucial things. And Beaver Island, uh, especially in the winter, uh, was a place that could really be separated out from, um, from other uh, people. Um, but there were other reasons for doing it too, and I'll get into those in a minute. Okay, here's a, a picture from um, Hans Christian Andersen. This is the Emperor's New Clothes. It came out about the time Strang was coronated as um, king of uh, uh, heaven and earth, as he called himself. Um, this was done on Beaver Island in a half-finished, um, church um, that was basically a glorified log cabin and it wasn't even finished. His throne was stuffed with pre-moss. Um, uh, he used props that George Adams, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, Shakespearean actor brought along. Um, and it's all kind of very uh, funny uh, to us, um, but people on the island took it really seriously. 
a good number of people on the island seriously believed they were bringing around about the second coming of Jesus Christ. And they were, there was, in addition to the con men, there were a lot of true believers on the island. And we may laugh at the notion of a, an independent kingdom, uh, a quasi-independent kingdom on American soil, but this man didn't. This is uh, Millard Fillmore, president of the United States. And Fillmore um, and the people around him took Strang seriously enough, as many of you know, that in 1851, I think that right? I think that's right. He sent in the US Navy's first iron hulled warship, the USS Michigan. Here's a, a later picture of it to raid the island and bring Strang back to justice. And um, uh, there was a militia with him. It looked like there might be a, a naval invasion, but in the end, Strang uh, went into hiding, but then came out and surrendered and urged his followers to surrender. They were all back, brought back to Detroit um, and charged with really serious crimes. And um, Strang was eventually found innocent. So one of the delicious ironies of um, this story is that uh, Millard Fillmore left office in 1853 as one of the uh, least popular or effective presidents. And while the president <laughs> who went after the king lost power, the king uh, was still in power. Um, so uh, what else did Strang do on Beaver Island? Well, one of the things the King of Confidence, my book uh, does is pin down um, more than any other book so far. Um, I think there's some really good books on Strang, but um, that, um, he was indeed running a pirate colony out of Beaver Island. Um, so um, at least one book on Strang and said, oh, no, 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 no. This is all anti-Mormon hatred. Um, it's a little bit like what's going on in Russia now, right? It's, it's some people say, oh, no, no, there's no, there's no bombings, right? This is what one author said. And there was a lot of anti-Mormon hatred at this time. Terrible, awful. And um, I've dug up evidence that firm up, uh, you know, I, I've tracked down arrests. Um, one thing I did is, is uh, found this jailbreak in 1853, where one of Strang's top lieutenants gets arrested for horse rustling. And um, uh, sure enough, Strang comes to town and sure enough, there's <laughs> very quickly a jailbreak and they all leave. Um, and so um, uh, Strang, um, would raid, he'd send people out to steal horses, but he'd also send these ships down to raid places, not, and, and, as you know, um, nearby, but also as far south as Chicago. Um, and so, um, uh, as many of you know, and I'll explain why I'm showing a picture of Napoleon Bonaparte in a minute, but he also was a very, uh, in the, in, the early 18, in the early years of the 1850s, he took over Emmett County. Strang's uh, people were sort of totally elected to Emmett County. And Strang was twice elected to the Michigan legislature. Uh, I show this picture of Napoleon because Napoleon was a hero of Strang's. And uh, Napoleon was one of the people on the Emmett County voter rolls, right? Like he was eligible to vote, and it, along with Charles Douglas, uh, Elvira Field. That, so Strang, um, in 1854, uh, um, was elected uh, the Emmett County vote. He twice ran for, um, for uh, uh, state rep uh, in Lansing, and he was twice elected. And the, uh, <laughs> this gives you some indication of the um, uh, was he elected fairly? No, he was not. The vote count in 18, the 1854 election in uh, Emmett County was 695 votes for Strang and zero votes against Strang. Um, so, uh, but then he went to Lansing and um, surprised everybody. Um, he became, um, uh, even his worst enemy said, wow, this guy is a competent lawmaker. He's smart, he's well-read, he writes really well. He speaks really well. And then something else happened that was really um, interesting and fascinating for me as a writer. Strang, he was, he'd always been an abolitionist. Um, I think one of the things the King of Confidence does really well is 
um, sort of pinned down what his abolitionism was all about, right? Um, and sort of track it back to its roots. I, I, I find an incident in Virginia that he was eyewitness to some horrifically ugly consequences of slavery. Um, but um, he gets to Lansing and in his second term in the state house is right when the Republicans, this brand new party, this incredible force, they take over uh, the Senate, the House and the governorship. And Strang's a Democrat, but he works with them to help to try to mitigate the effects of slavery and to oppose it wherever possible. At one point he spoke on the floor of the, the Michigan House for two hours on this subject. And one of the things he did is um, there was this fugitive slave law of 1850. And uh, as many of you know, this was a national law that allowed slave owners and slave hunters to come up into Northern states and capture escaped slave and bring them back to um, the South. And Strang was a, a leading proponent of this law passed in the Michigan legislature that made it very, very hard, practically speaking, for um, uh, slave chasers to do that. And I, it's a really interesting thing for me because it's the one time I see where Strang was acting against his own best interests because um, this did not endear him to his fellow Democrats and the Republicans weren't that interested in him either. So he, he ended up um, uh, sort of ending his career as a politician, which had been so um, amazing until then in, in the kind of quiet um, uh, failure. Um, Strang's abolitionism is, <laughs> I think it's real, uh, but it's also cuts both ways. And this was another thing I found. He, he, as many of you know, his newspaper on Beaver Island, which was quite a good newspaper, was called the Northern Ireland, uh, Islander. And I read, <laughs> I think I read every, I don't know if I read every word, but I read every issue. And I found among the stories, um, this piece by this guy, Fred Douglas. That was the byline in the uh, Northern Islander. And um, of, of course, the piece was written by Frederick Douglass in 1855. Or, and uh, Frederick Douglass, as we know, is the, this escaped slave who became one of the leading forces of, of abolitionism uh, in the United States. And the interesting thing about this story was that I couldn't, Strang had excerpted a new book, a new memoir that um, uh, Douglas had just written, and I couldn't find this excerpt anywhere. So I think Strang excerpted himself and ran it. But what's really interesting is what he excerpted. So the section is, um, deals with when it's appropriate for slaves to steal from their masters. So on the one hand, Strang is this idealist who's against slavery. On the other hand, if you were living on Beaver Island and you were <laughs> getting in boats and stealing from people, and you read this justification of theft in certain circumstances, um, it, it, it read differently on Beaver Island than it would have in other places. And so again, with Strang, we have the idealist and the opportunist um, all in the same, <laughs> in the same uh, package. All right, um, this is what got Strang in really hot water, as many of you know, with his, his people. So this is a picture of, um, it says a, a bloomer there. So that's the, uh, these pantaloons were later called bloomers. And this is a, uh, you know, a cartoon from the period um, showing the dangers of these new, this new fashion of bloomerism. And, and we think of bloomers as this feminist symbol. And I think in many ways it was, I think Strang's, was in some ways a proto-feminist, um, uh, but people were wearing bloomers on, women were wearing bloomers on Beaver Island a year before they were bloomers, because this was Amelia Bloomer, this feminist wore them, but long before her, um, women were wearing them uh, on Beaver Island, as many of you know, and so, um, but this got Strang into a lot of hot water, because eventually he uh, ordered all women on the island to wear bloomers. Um, was he doing this because he was for women's liberation, the women's, the emerging women's movement? Maybe a little bit, but I, we also know from cults that one of the things you do is you control dress. And this became a huge controversy on the island. If you were for Strang, 
uh, if you're a woman, you wore the bloomers. And if you're a man, you encourage your wife to wear the bloomers. And if you're against strang, you refuse to wear the bloomers and you told your wife you can't wear the bloomers. And so there was this sort of bloomer war. And of course it was a, about much more than that. We can talk about that. Uh, but eventually um, Strang's uh, enemies um, uh, gathered around and formed this conspiracy um, um, to kill him. Uh, I think underlying the Bloomer problem was polygamy. Strang, by the time he was killed in 1856, had five wives. Um, I think I mentioned that he was against polygamy in theory, but not in, in practice. And he gave up his, his theoretical opposition to it. And this is Strang's uh, illustration of Strang's house on Beaver Island. I don't know how accurate it is. Um, in any case, um, in 1856, um, uh, there was a plot to kill him, almost certainly involving the state of Michigan and the federal government. Um, the USS Michigan, that warship we um, saw earlier, came back to Beaver Island. By this time, the, the captain was on pretty good terms with Strang. But Strang from this house uh, saw that the Michigan had arrived on Beaver Island at a, at a time he didn't expect. And um, Strang supposedly said, wow, this is, this is bad news. The captain uh, sent a representative forward to get Strang and um, uh, Strang was um, shot as he approached the boat uh, and, and beaten uh, by um, followers, former followers of his who uh, ran onto the boat and um, the, boat, the ship then sailed and no one ever was sent to prison for, um, for uh, Strang's murder. Um, so um, uh, it, the interesting thing is if you go to Beaver Island, you're not gonna see much evidence of Strang's um, uh, uh, colony there. Uh, after Strang's murder, as many of you know that the uh, Mormons were first off in the worst terrible conditions. They just basically were told to get off the island or be killed without their property, without their clothing, basically uh, their effects. But in Burlington where he, is, so there's not much evidence of Strang on Beaver Island, except for a name, St. James, et cetera. But in Burlington, this little town in Wisconsin, there's, this is the house where Strang died in 1856 after he was paralyzed from the waist down um, and taken off the island and taken back to his parents' home, which was now in Burlington. This is where he died. And a lot of the stuff, um, if you're interested in Strang, you can still see in Burlington, uh, including the last, one of the last remnants of Strang's church. That's, that's me at the at, at Strangite church. I've met some followers of Strang's. Uh, they're not uh, just in this little town um, of Burlington in Wisconsin. They're, they're, they're in other places in the country. And um, so it, 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 the church is still there and it's still, you know, a, a, a legitimate, uh, faith and and so it's interesting to to hear their response. In any case, um, I would love. I'm I'm with a group of experts, and so I would love to talk to you. Um, this is uh, about this guy, and um, uh, these are the two versions of my book. The 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 one with the sort of um, a sunburst behind Strang is uh, and kind of T.T. Uh, Barnum look to it is the hardback, and there's. The paperback is just recently out, and um, it, it's got this sort of, uh, I call them the P.T. Barnum version, the Edgar Allan Poe version. Um, in any case, anxious to talk to you. Thank you so much uh, for listening to my, to my tale here. Well, thank you so much. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, we do have some questions down in the chat. And just um, as a side note to anybody out there who's interested in the book, um, I forgot to mention at the beginning of the program that we do have um, the paperback version of the book in our museum store here at the Historical Society. And I am putting that link into the chat right now. So if any of you, oh, let me see. I just put it in a private message. Let me try this again. There we go. Um, if you are at all interested in, in purchasing the book and supporting the Historical Society at the same time, you're welcome to do that. Um, and one question we did have is, uh, you, you mentioned that Strang grew up in the Burned Over District in New York. What, what town was that? Was there a specific town? Uh, he grew up in, uh, what's the name of the town? Um, I have to look in the book. Um, uh, <laughs> Read the book um, for more information. Yeah, 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 thank you, Beth. Well, well, well played, much better than the author did on that one. Uh, but um, 
it's a really, uh, I, I went to Western New York and, and it, it's a really interesting thing that burned over district and just um, uh, the way the Erie Canal changed our country. Um, one writer, I really like this description, called it a psychic highway that it just brought not just people west, but just incredible new ideas. Yeah. All right, um, a couple other questions. Uh, the church that's in Burlington, oh, is the church in Burlington? And does anyone live in the house where Strang died? Is it private home or? <laughs> no, that's, that, there's, I have a story to tell with that. I'm a big kayaker and um, I was kayaking, those pictures from a day, I was kayaking the Fox River with a friend. There's, um, Burlington's a beautiful little town and, and it's at the confluence of the Fox and White Rivers. So, um, and Strang's house is, uh, that house where he died is right near the White River. Uh, and his settlement was right near the White River. But anyway, we, we, we just kayaked on the Fox right near there. And I said to my friend who, who knew my book, I said, do you want to see where Strang lived? And, and do you want to see his colony? And, and he said, yeah, I do. And so um, we drove over to the house and there was this guy, I don't know, in his 20s or 30s, you know, young guy. And I out with his lawnmower, his riding lawnmower out cutting the grass. And I waved him down. I said, uh, um, hey, do you live here? He goes, oh, yeah, yeah I live here. <laughs> Just this dude kind of guy. And um, he, uh, I said, uh, do, you, do you know about this? He goes, oh, man, my boss told me some crazy stuff happened in this house. <laughs> and I'm like, he knew not. I mean, it's like he, he knew about it. So it's interesting, like in Burlington, Strang is more kind of present, but he's not sort of part of the lore the way he is in Northern Michigan and, and, and in Beaver Island. And so that's very interesting to me. So he, he, was, he was interested, he knew the rough outlines of it, but he mostly was baffled by why tourists would occasionally show up at his front lawn when he was cutting it and ask him about the house. Yeah, so. Oh, that's fantastic. Um... Let's see, another question. Um, what was Strang's connection to Holy Island? Holly Island? Uh, so uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure about the question exactly. Um, so Strang, you know, the, the Mormons were spread, had they had, they, there were other Mormons on the nearby islands there. Um, uh, the, the Native Americans were on Beaver Island, moved over, and they were sort of like the, um, I mean, the island politics are interesting because you had three groups that were ostracized by the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. um, and so I may not answer your question directly, and I, I, I'm glad to, if you send me an email, um, try to get information for you, but um, there were, you know, the Mormons uh, who suffered greatly um, to the hands of other people and other Americans. And then there were Native Americans. Um, and, and then there were the Irish, uh, the fishermen, but the fishermen, as we know, were, were increasingly Irish at that time and survivors of the potato famine. This was, this was when I think, you know, it's like a, a migration like we're seeing now out of the Ukraine. And um, all three of these um, groups were marginalized by mainstream American culture. And so, um, and in this dynamic at the time that the, the Native Americans, at least in my reading, were sort of in the middle of it, of it and maybe not um, treated well by, by either group, but they sort of shifted allegiances. Strang claimed that he, in this very paternalistic, uh, in a New York newspaper, he claimed that, you know, he was the great, the lo beloved uh, white man among the, the Native Americans and that he, it brought civilization, just the usual uh, stuff that people said back then um, when they didn't mean it. And I think he really didn't mean it. Um, but um, uh, he also, interestingly in Emmett County, when his people got control of Emmett County, one of the things they did is enforce this, um, this state uh, liquor law. Um, and that made them very unpopular, not only because um, people like to drink, but, but that Strang would use it as an excuse of, to allow his ships to go out and claim to be searching other ships for liquor, for illegal liquor. And there was a big illegal or a big liquor trade in the Great Lakes then, there's no question about it. Um, but um, 
meanwhile, um, according to his critics, he was stealing, his people were stealing stuff and confiscating stuff from the ships. So uh, yeah, with all parts of Strang, it's really, really hard to read. I mean, I guess if you have to err on the side of um, idealist versus opportunist, it's, you can usually, uh, an opportunist is a good bet, bet, but I, you know, he was so complicated and that's what made him interesting. Gotcha. Um, more questions. Let's see. So after Strang was shot on Beaver Island, did his followers regroup in Burlington? Did and they took him to convalesce there, or, or how did that? Happen? Yeah, yeah. So what happened was um, after this um, shooting, um, uh, gangs of of sort of vigilantes uh, they came once and and they were sort of repelled, but then. You know, Strang had made no friends. And again, part of this may be anti-Mormon prejudice, but the, the fishermen hated him because he, they claimed he stole their fish, their nets, their livelihood. Um, and, um, but also many people from the area hated him. Um, and so this huge kind of posse descended on the island and, and it was ugly, you know, they just forced the Mormons off. And there are reports from, uh, from the time of these poor refugees in just the most heinous conditions. But before that second raid, um, Strang's people, he was, had been paralyzed from the waist down by his attack. And his attack was really brutal. He was shot, but they didn't kill him. So they shot him some more. So then they beat him <laughs> with pistol. It, anyway, it, it was, you know, the, just a brutal, terrible story. And he was paralyzed from the waist down, but he lasted, you know, a number of weeks, but they moved him back to Burlington and that's where he died. Um, and then finally his people were forced off the the island and, 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 you know, we call it the Emerald Island now. And it's because partly because the people who replaced him were, you know, it's, this is, um, you know, partly Irish culture from, and again, these were, I can't speak for um, all of them, but some of the original people were, were people who'd had to flee the potato famine, which is one of the great horrors of 19th century history. And so, um, no, no one who is contesting for this land had it had it easy. Well, and it, it's interesting because Emmett County is actually named after Irish patriot Robert Emmett. Mm. Uh, so there's definitely a connection there. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. Um, a couple other questions we have. Um, let me see. I wrote this one down. Oh, why did people think that the world was ending in 1848? Well, um, this was you know, interesting. My, my, my previous book had been in the 16th century and, and people were sure the world was ending. Um, people saw uh, various biblical signs, et cetera. And one of the signs they saw were these reports of, of um, sea monsters. Um, uh, it's hard to say why, why people, I think, I think that the, the culture was just, this, things were so up in the air. And again, I, I don't want to, make you know easy or stupid comparisons but i mean i think any of us who watch the news i mean I, you know i said to my students i teach at DePaul university in chicago and my students and i were talking about this situation in you in, in the ukraine and and i said you know like um this is weird that uh you know i grew up uh, i'm 61 years old i grew up hiding under desks to practice for nuclear wars Right. And now all of a sudden, my students and I have two kids about the age of my students who now all of a sudden have this vague fear of nuclear annihilation. And I, I just think there are times I was talking to some other writers. I'm at a writer's event here in Springfield and, and people were just saying, you know, it just does feel like a really weird, bleak, kind of doomed time. And I think that if, if you are so inclined, you can start to see the apocalypse <laughs> in, in certain moments when, when the world seems really unsettled. And, and this was definitely one of those periods when things seemed really up in the air. Right. Um, Renee has a question. She would like to know, uh, how did Strang identify Beaver Island as where he wanted to, <laughs> what, what was his connection to so Beaver Island? So according to him, when he was on <laughs> um, one of his travels, he had a, whenever Strang needed something, he had a, a vision 
and a prophecy. And um, uh, that a Native American had come to him in this, you know, dream state. And all in people in his dream states all talked in this kind of sense, like biblical English. So thou should go us to, you know, um, in fact, um, the guy I showed you, um, John uh, uh, Bennett, uh, the guy who had the little um, um, hand inside his vest like Napoleon, um, this con man had probably staked it out. And Strang saw it. That, here's something that I'm sure a lot of folks on the Zoom uh, chat know, but um, until the railroads came through, and the railroads hadn't come through then, to get from Detroit to Chicago, you had to go all the way around the Great Lakes. And so Beaver Island was this crucial stop for wood because most of the steamboats used wood. And Trang was very, I mean, again, among the, the complicated things, he was like an early environmentalist. You know, one of the, he came up with these, um, you know, supposedly divinely inspired, uh, uh, these books of the law, this thing called the, the book of the law of the Lord. But one of the things was you'll grow back trees, right? Like when we cut down trees, we grow back trees. And it sounds very 21st century, you know? Um, but it's just that he knew that lumber was such a, a, a crucial, he didn't own the lumber, by the way, <laughs> it's U.S. government lumber. Um, and we could talk about whether it, it should have been a Native American. There'd been a treaty that technically forced the Native Americans off the island, but that, you know, this was a period of land grab by the U.S. government. But in any case, it wasn't Strang's lumber. Um, so apparently he saw it on a, on a steamboat ride he, he had and had this idea. Uh, John C. Bennett, this this other guy, was a real conniver and really, really smart. Abraham Lincoln talked about how smart he was in setting up Nauvoo. And he seems to have been the first one to say to Strang, um, look, you should think about moving to an island. That's fascinating. Um, we have a couple more questions. Um, two of these actually go together. Um, there is a question about why Strang turned to piracy? If, if, you know, did he need those items? Did he not have another way of getting them? And then the other part of the question, uh, Bob would like to know if the colony on Beaver Island had any other commerce besides, uh, besides piracy. Yeah, so wood would be, lumber would be a big, a big, so Strang, when, when Strang was killed, he was killed in this sort of a uh, uh, the way I picture it's like a maze, kind of like these lumber was lined up um, at, in St. James uh, in these big tall rows and it's sort of a hallway of lumber because the, the steamboats needed to refuel there and so they had it all piled up and that's and it sort of led down to the dock and that's where he was killed. Um, so lumber would have been one. Um, I mean, I, I'm assuming that, um, there was fishing um, but, <laughs> you know, Strang got this huge population and it's contested how many people that were there. Let's just say 500. I think that's a pretty good guess. Um, my editor at, at Little Brown was always mad at me because I wouldn't quite name a number. And I said, well, there's just like all these different numbers. Do you want me to just pick one based on me being Miles Harvey and having a, you know, uh, all seeing mine? But I think 500 is okay. He had 500 people on this, and we know Beaver Island in, in this group, it, you know, um, sustaining a sudden huge input of people was going to be hard. And so, no, I would say um, theft was one of their main, was one of their main industries. Um, and, and I, but I do think we, one of the things that's important when we talk about that is talking about like, these were people who thought they were really bringing the second coming of Christ. Like a lot of people, um, like I said, there were con men on this island, these cynics, right? But there were also these true believers. And they, they were true believers who were willing to, to uh, make moral sacrifices for what they thought was a greater good, right? They, like, we don't have time for human laws. Like, we don't have time for Michigan state statutes. We're bringing the second coming around. We need to get this stuff so we can eat and so we can um, make shrines, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there is a couple questions, but also um, a couple comments. Um, Andrew, uh, Hannah, let us know um, if anybody would like to read his chat. It is there where some of the parts of the USS Michigan ended up in the Erie Maritime Museum in Pennsylvania. And, oh, wow. Uh, Fairpoint, Ohio and Toledo, Ohio. Um, just in case anyone's interested in that. Thank you for sharing. 
Um, yeah, and then you. he also mentions, which I was actually going to ask you, uh, Miles, uh, Elizabeth Whitney Williams was a lightkeeper here in Harbor Springs for 29 years, but she was on Beaver Island first in her childhood, and then her yep. family left because of King String, and then yep. they came back and she was a lightkeeper there for 14 years. So did you read her autobiography, A Child of the Sea? A absolutely, I read it. And I, I got to say, Beth, that I, I took... Um, I took it a lot more seriously than I. I mean, I I understand why historians would say, "Well, this is hearsay. This is a child remembering stories from her childhood." But um, I, I think there's a, a fair amount of sexism. Um, I, I found some of the stories um, she recounted in that to make perfect sense when you put them in the timeline and see what's happening. I'm not saying the whole book is right. And there are these secondary stories. Was Strang's first wife who never joined the Mormon, Mormon church, was she basically um, <laughs> helping other Mormons escape by canoe or whatever? I Probably not. I don't think so. I don't know. But there, I thought there was just a lot. Like To me, that book was, I found it really a useful book. And um, a lot of this stuff about Strang is overblown and not real. And just the fact that this woman wrote it, I found, um, so I found her book really useful. Um, you have to approach it with caution as a factual document, but I think there's more fact in there than previous researchers have given uh, credit. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's a fascinating book. I, I, yeah, I picked it up to to try to learn more about her time at Little Traverse. And of course it's only last like three pages that she mentions it, but um, it's beside the point. Uh, one other uh, question here. Um, did Strang have any children? Yeah, he had a lot of children. And uh, I've heard from some of the children's 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 children or whatever since then. Um, yeah, yeah, four of his five wives were pregnant uh, when he was killed, and, and the story, I, um, there's a there's a book by a, a, a woman named Vicky Cleverly Speak that really gets it's a it's a really good book, and it really gets into it's called um, I have it here. God has made us a kingdom, and Vicky's I've I've sort of by Zoom befriended her, um, uh, and we've uh, it it really gets into the women of this island, um, and Strang's wives and. And so um, I, at the end of my book, um, but it, I draw heavily from Vicky's research there, I sort of talk about what happened to his wives. And some of them went on to lead completely fascinating lives. Many of them led very sad lives. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so he definitely had, he has several lines of children. <laughs> Uh, looks like we have uh, at least one more question. And if you do have any questions, folks, we're getting near the end of our time here. So please put them in the chat as you think of them here. Um, this question is from Mike. Did Strang ever cross swords with Brigham Young once Joseph Smith was killed? Well, um, you, you know, I talk in the book and it, here's, here's some other kind of uh, original research in the book that I sort of, so Strang in 1853, um, Young, uh, to, I don't think they ever met. I have, I have no sign they ever met. Strang never went to Nauvoo, but um, there was a succession crisis after Smith died. And um, Strang was in some ways Young's greatest threat. And that lasted until 1853. In 1853, there was serious, serious talk that Strang would be appointed governor of Utah. And that was not just, um, and he started <laughs> for Washington, this like right after a new administration, a Democratic administration got in. Strang started for Washington, um, hoping to get the governorship of Utah, which would have been a, a real mess. Um, but people took him seriously, including um, Young's representatives in Washington were like, this, this guy Strang is serious. Uh, and, but he never made it to Washington. He went to his hometown and, um, uh, it's one of the many fun episodes of the book. Uh, there, one of his old friends said, oh, you're a prophet. Here, drink this strychnine and you'll, you'll live. And he said, like, no, I'm not doing that. And I said, he said, I thought you were, you know, you could drink poison. Didn't you say that? You know, and, uh, and then Strang, there was 
he, he was embarrassed in his hometown. And I don't even know if he made it to DC. He definitely started for DC. There's reports of him moving east uh, and he gets to his hometown. And then I, I couldn't find absolute proof that he even made it to DC, but he never got the governorship. But he was, he, he was a serious enough, serious enough threat, threat where Young viewed him that way, so. All right, I don't think I missed any questions. I'll wait just a few seconds here to, if anybody is still typing. Um, and while I'm waiting a moment, I will again put in the chat the link to the Historical Society's online store uh, where you can purchase King of Confidence. Um, I'm partway through it right now and it is fantastic. So I very much encourage everyone to get a copy. Um, well, and please support the Historical Society too. Oh, um, this is um, important stuff. I think that might be all the questions we have. If we have any more, we'll have to read the book to find out. But um, thank you so much for joining us, Miles. This has been fantastic and a, a very interesting chapter in our history up north here. Um, and we really appreciate you sharing it with us. Great. Well, and, and as I say in the book, I think it's a very uh, interesting chapter in American history, I think, um, as well as uh, Michigan and, and Northern Michigan history. I, I, I think Strang, I think one of the things that's different about the King of Confidence, I'll go with that, is I, I see him as this lightning rod for all the incredible enthusiasms of the mid-19th century. And it's, I find him to be really fascinating. All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. We hope to see you at some of our next lectures and we hope you have a wonderful night. Thank you all again.